Hi, Jana. Hi, Frank. It's nice to see you. It's nice to see you too. Um, I um, I wanted to uh, to talk to you today because um, today was kind of a historical moment, I think. Uh, and you tell me if you think the same way for for Palestine and and the the struggle for for justice in Palestine, for accountability in Palestine, and. Uh, so um, we've had the first day of the hearings in the case that South Africa brought to the International Criminal Co uh, International Court of Justice, the ICJ, uh, against Israel. Um, you can maybe briefly tell us why it was so quick and that today uh, was like an emergency in a way session about preventive measures to stop what's happening in Gaza, and that the whole case might take actually a lot longer. But um, uh, I know a lot of people, a lot of common friends were actually at The Hague. Uh, I know that, you know, the some of the lawyers involved um, are also friends. Um, before I ask you a question, I, I've got to say, I've, I've watched par uh, part of the proceedings. The fact that it was South Africa, the fact that it was people that have gone through horrible things, uh, apartheid South Africa, uh, felt incredibly, incredibly good and so powerful. Um, and um, I wanted to ask you, uh, so did, did you feel also that this was such a powerful moment? And what did you make in a way of the, of the first day proceedings? And before you answer, tomorrow, will be the turn of Israel to respond. And we can talk about this maybe later. Um, Frank, today was historic. And I have to be honest, I wept. And I wept as I was hearing these submissions, and I was cheering, um, but for so many reasons. The first is because of exactly what you just said. The solidarity that exists between Palestine and South Africa, between Palestinians and anti-apartheid activists. The fact that, the, and, and this has been going on for decades, it brought to, it brought this to this moment where we see how all of this solidarity has come to get, come together. You know, it's important for people to understand that the deep ties between the PLO and the ANC, the deep ties between the anti-apartheid movement and the Palestine liberation movement. And the fact that we have a country that itself suffered under a very brutal apartheid regime, now bringing before the International Court of Justice another apartheid regime, which many South Africans have said is even worse than the apartheid that they lived under. So there was something very powerful about that and very powerful about Israel being forced to confront this issue of genocide, particularly given that one of the reasons that the world has turned a blind eye to Israel's actions over the course of the past 75 years is because of the genocide that was committed in, in Europe during the Second World War. And so there was something very powerful about seeing this solidarity, these people from South Africa coming forward and saying that, that the, and standing with Palestinians and demanding an end to this genocide. It was also very historic because within the first 10 seconds, we, this, the focus, it was clear the focus wasn't just on what happened in the aftermath of October 7th. But they began with the Nakba and they went from the Nakba all the way up to the current date. And so it was really an expression that what Israel has been doing isn't just this one time, time event, but that it's being put in its proper context, which is that Israel has been trying to erase and get rid of Palestinians since 1948. And so it was very powerful to witness this, to hear this, and to feel heard 
for the first time in such a long time. The other part that was really incredible was if you just sat through submission after submission, and I must say they were very professional submissions, very well done. The, 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 the submissions were overwhelming and you had to hear through just exactly what it is that Palestinians of, in Gaza have lived through for the past nearly 100 days and this extent to which Israel has managed to get away with it. And that alone was also very powerful. I um I mean this is a moment that um again I couldn't watch the whole proceedings um but I've 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 rewatched some of it including Blina's uh and sorry Blina if you're watching us I can't pronounce your name uh I've known Blina actually for for many many years and and it's also you know I, I've known John Dugard for many years and even Max Duplessis as well and um I mean, I don't want to be emotional or anything, but I felt so much love today for these people, for, for John Duga, for Max, for Blina. Uh, and, you know, when you feel, I don't know, I mean, I think we, you know, we, we spoke about this before, like that's, you know, in the last hundred days, you get a sense that maybe actually finally and it's horrible because there's so many dead, but this is, maybe this is a moment. Maybe something's happening. You know, uh, this is definitely, Israel has never had to face the law like it's facing today. You know, the 2004 opinion at the ICJ was an advisory, non-binding opinion. This is binding. This also is going to ask the question if the ICJ comes with uh, comes back in, in a week, two weeks, three weeks in favor of South Africa uh, and Palestine uh, and says, you've got to stop what you're doing. Uh, the, it's going to be, the mirror is going to be turned to other states as well. You know, they've got an obligation also to act. And for me, what was so powerful, and Blina said it in a final like statement, is that it's also South Africa as a country judging itself under its obligation to prevent a genocide. And this was so, so powerful. But he also asked the question about where are the other states? I know some of them have joined now, I've, I've you know, written in support of South Africa, but where are the so-called enlightened uh, states of like France, you know, U the UK and the US? Um, so do you think this case actually is about actually much more than only South Africa, Israel, and, and Palestine, of course. Definitely. Look, I want to be clear um, that what is being sought is, of course, provisional. And what they're seeking is an end to Israel's bombing campaign, an end to the incitement, uh, holding people to account, to preserve the, the evidence, to, to stop these measures of starving Palestinians in Gaza to uh, restore electricity, fuel, all of these things. So it's provisional. But even though it's provisional that they're seeking, this is much bigger than that. This is much bigger than that. And that's why it's so important. You know, I've, I've long said that, that the, there's, there's a lot of problems with the international legal system. And one of the problems with the international legal system is that it's like any other legal system, that it depends on power. And, and so this particular case isn't just about Israel and South Africa and Palestine, but it's really putting the entire legal system on trial. What do I mean by that? When you look around and you judge systems, you judge legal systems, you have to look at them on the basis of how it is that they protect the most vulnerable segments of society. And when you look at the international legal system, one of the reasons that many people, me and others, have said that it's failed is because it's failed Palestinians. And it's, it's failed Palestinians because, because of politics. 
And yet, if you look at, at the system as a system, it should be protecting Palestinians. Palestinians are among the most vulnerable in the world. This is a stateless population. It's a refugee population made refugees by Israel. And 50% of Gaza is children. So if the international legal system cannot protect stateless refugees and children, then there's something very terribly wrong with the legal system. So what this case is about is, yes, it's about seeking, a prov seeking provisional measures to stop the genocide. But it's about much more than that. It's really putting the entire international legal system on trial and putting a spotlight on the entire international legal system. And that's why it is so important. I do want to say something about um, the 2004 case, because I was involved in that, in that case, the Wall decision. And while that was an advisory opinion, and Israel, um, as you said, effectively blew it off because it's an advisory opinion, it actually laid down a lot of framework and law that states around the world are also continuing to latch onto. And so what is very important is that while in 2004, they were able to evade any responsibility, that's not the case in 2024. Because in the case of 2024, we actually see that this is a claim on the basis of genocide. It's not an advisory opinion. And because it is not an advisory opinion, it is binding. And so this isn't the first time that Israel has been faced, uh, has had to confront um, courts. And what I've always said is that you don't need to be a lawyer. You don't need to be, to, to be a scholar to understand that what Israel is doing is wrong. You just, you don't need to do that. But we also know that, that when, when we are confronted with law, when Israel has to bring its case and weigh it against law, it's going to lose. It lost in 2004, and it's going to lose again in 2024 because what Israel has been doing not only defies law, it defies justice. It defies, it defies logic. It defies morality. It defies humanity. And that's why there are so many people around the world who are in support of Palestine and Palestinian freedom. Um, I want to ask you another, actually another comment about, again, Blina, because, and uh, I refer to her because I've watched her speech a few times. Um, she said something that sent sort of goosebumps all over my body when she, she quoted um, a Palestinian pastor who said that the question you're going to have to ask yourselves, and that's everyone, the international community, the legal system, states, citizens, is like, what were you doing? Where were you while Gaza was being genocided? And, and that's why, again, I think this is about much more than the law, than Israel, than Palestine. It's about us, right? As a collective, a collective of human beings, don't, don't you think? You're absolutely right. This is about us. And it's about where we stand when it comes to humanity. And the, one of the most powerful things about what he said and what she then uplifted is that, again, it's taking it out of the context of law, legality, citations, et cetera, but asking the very basic question about humanity. What is it that we as individuals did to try to stop this genocide? And that's why this case is so important. Okay, and that, now it's my, my final question. Um, tomorrow, it's going to be Israel's turn to, I guess, put its case in front of the court to defend itself. Uh, to be honest, like listening to the speeches today, I'm like, what are they going to come up with? What can they answer? You know, and the, one of the last statement of the South African team was very interesting. 
it said, like, and I'm quoting, in the speeches to this court today, South Africa has chosen, as you've heard, to avoid the sharing of graphic videos and photos. It was decided against turning this court into a theater for spectacle. And for me, the way I read this is the South African team sending a message to the world, to the court, that this is exactly what Israel is going to do. Uh, so what do you think Israel is going to do tomorrow? I think Israel is going to do a few things. One is it's going to come forward and say there's no need for provisional measures because it's already scaled back, which is false. That's absolutely false. Two, it's going to claim that it has a right to self-defense. That will be the crux of their argument. And that if there have been any transgressions, there are transgressions that are collateral, collateral in scope, but that the intent to actually commit genocide is not there. This is what we already know that they are going to argue. I mean, we, we kind of know. We, we haven't heard the full scope of it. Um, but that's going to be essentially the, the scope of it. And that's it. That's all that they can say. And the problem with anything that they can say is that the South African team, uh, or the team that represented South Africa, because some of them were not South African, was, was very good at heading all of that off. They already addressed all of the arguments that Israel is going to make. They address the argument when it comes to self-defense. And that argument, of course, is one that we've all been saying since the beginning, which is you cannot carry out a genocide, even if it can be said that a state is acting in self-defense, genocide is never acceptable. Um, and they've already, so they've already put forward, they've already made clear that whatever Israel is going to say is legally not sound because, again, there is no defense to genocide. You just cannot do it. One of the amazing things, Frank, has been in all of this is that Israeli arrogance has been so high because they've had such levels of impunity that for the past 90 plus days, each and every day, as somebody here living in Haifa, I can tell you that I hear each and every day a genocidal statement. Whether that statement is put forward by the Israeli president when he says there are no innocents in Gaza, whether it's put forward by the prime minister who makes a similar claim but then goes on to invoke biblical verses, whether it's made by the minister of heritage who says that they should nuke Gaza, whether it's made by the minister of finance who says that uh, Gaza should be um, thinned out, whether it's made by the Minister of Defense, who says that Palestinians are human animals and then proceeds to cut off water, electricity, food, and fuel supplies, or whether it's made by people in the media or by individual soldiers or by individual commanders. It's such a level of, of genocidal statements that the only reason that they're repeating this is because they've been so emboldened for 75 years. And so now finally, we see that all of this is going to come back and bite Israel once again. And so what I expect tomorrow is a lot of theatrics. I expect that there will be claims of self-defense. I expect I expect that they're going to downplay the genocidal statements, even though there's no way to downplay them. I expect that they're going to somehow attribute this to individual um, uh, soldiers. And that's it. But one thing that I think wasn't touched upon today, which I was hoping would be touched upon, was that it's, it's not only that we've seen the flattening of Gaza City, world, uh, Palestine's largest city, and the destruction of Beit Hanun, there's not a single, according to people who live in that area, there's not a single house that remains there. But one thing that's really, that wasn't touched upon today was the fact that soldiers then take over buildings and then blow them up. And so it shows you just how much this genocidal intent 
has been seeped into the mindset and into the operations of the Israeli army. And that, I can't wait to hear what the Israelis are going to say about that. We'll have to wait uh, until tomorrow, I guess. Um, uh, in a way, I was, um, I, uh, I'm more in a way interested in what they're going to say than what South Africa has just said, because, you know, the, as you said, you know, the uh, genocide was, was turned into um, a crime against humanity. Uh, but before the law turned it into a crime against humanity, there was genocide you know, genocide happened, you know, maybe it wasn't called genocide uh, before Lemkin, uh, you know, sort of uh, coined the word, but there were genocides. So, uh, and I'd read the 84 pages of the, of the application and you go, yeah, we know, we know about this. It's like such a clear cut case, you know, but what are they going to, what, what are they going to come back with? And it's, because, you know, I was talking to Suzanne Abulawa and who quoted Norman Filkenstein and saying like, you know, Israel is turning to like a, a lunatic state. But they are in the highest legal court in a way in the world. So they, I don't think they can go with like crazy statements of when Netanyahu went to the UN with his like picture of the Iranian bomb or the, they can't do this. I mean, except if they're actually completely mad, which they probably are, you know, are, you know, but anyway, so let's wait to see what's happening tomorrow. And, um, but again, seeing, seeing this beautiful team defending South Africa, uh, seeing all the people, I know people, friends who traveled from France, from Belgium on, in, on buses and stuff, felt like such, such a moment, you know, and it's really horrible because so many have died, but it's, uh, it, it was a, an amazing moment. So, uh, shukran Diana. Thank you. And, um, and uh, yeah, speak soon. Speak soon.